Welcome to another episode of the Longevity Blueprint Podcast. Today I have for a guest, Todd White. He has been a serial entrepreneur and creator since he was 17 years old. And today, after 15 years in the wine business, his life is dedicated to educating and helping people make better choices about food nutrition and how they think about consuming alcohol. As a founder of Dry Farm Wines, a writer, speaker, and leader in the organic natural wine movement, he's widely educated communities on conscious consumption. He's deeply passionate about bringing people together to share love and laughter through natural wine and the health benefits it provides. Todd is a self-described biohacker who practices daily meditation, Wim Hof breathing, cold thermogenesis, a ketogenic diet, and daily 22-hour intermittent fasting. Although today he just told me he's finishing a four-day water fast right before this podcast. (laughs) He's also a frequent speaker on topics including the ketogenic lifestyle, meditation, and the Dry Farm Wines unique company culture. His entire team gathers each morning for a meditation and gratitude practice. And today you're going to get to hear more about his amazing company. So welcome, Todd White. Wow, excited to be here. Got lots to share with your audience about fasting and longevity and love and laughter and wine and the dirty, dark secrets of the wine business. Yes, I, I'm eager to have you share those. So I'm sure you've had, heard this from countless others as you've been on many podcasts before, but I've had a tumultuous relationship with wine myself. I actually enjoyed beer in college. I actually really did enjoy it, but packed on a few pounds, became very bloated. (laughs) And I later discovered I had a gluten intolerance and shouldn't have been ever drinking beer anyways. But long story short, I tried to transition my palate to what I thought was more sophisticated wine, right? And ended up with all kinds of symptoms, headaches and flushing and palpitations and really just feeling lousy the next day. So I just gave it up. I just thought, okay, alcohol, wine's not for me. And alcohol in itself, as you mentioned, is a neurotoxin. <laughs> so we should be limiting our, our, our consumption. But I heard about your company years ago, and I did try your wine, and I was very pleasantly surprised that I tolerated it much better. Ended up on a fertility journey and was able to conceive, and then I was breastfeeding for a year. So I'm only just now finishing that. So I'm <laughs> excited to be able to now participate in consuming your your safe, healthy wines again. So I want to hear more about your company and I want you to share that with others. So tell us the story behind the story, behind you and your company. Well, I mean, the story behind the story was that Dry Farm Wines was never conceived as a business. I was had become ketogenic about six years ago, maybe a little more than that now, therapeutically ketogenic, like on a serious ketogenic experimentation as a biohacker. Six years ago, the ketogenic diet was relatively unknown other than to kind of forward thinking biohackers who who had started to experiment with it. Research started to accelerate on the ketogenic diet about eight or nine years ago. Then it reached a biohacking community six or seven years ago. And then finally now it's the number one search diet term on on Google. It's now very mainstream and and lots of people experiment with it primarily for weight loss. So anyway, um, which is why I initially experimented, not that I was overweight, but I was at a weight plateau that I wanted to break through and I just couldn't seem to break through and just low carb. So I started experimenting with ketogenic diet and at a therapeutic level, like seriously keto, blood testing and so on and so forth. And not only did I lose the plateau, not only break through the plateau, but I lost a lot more weight than I anticipated, didn't even intend to. And um, in addition to that, um, I continued a ketogenic lifestyle, and today I'm not therapeutically ketogenic. I'm what I would call modified keto, which is like the Atkins diet, which is very low carb, moderate protein, and moderate fat. A therapeutic ketogenic diet will be very high in fat. Um, and so I, um, about the same time, when, when this was happening, I found that I couldn't drink standard wines anymore. I live in the heart of the Napa Valley, which is the most important wine appellation in North America. I've been drinking wine since I was nine years old. I've been a lifelong wine aficionado, and I just love wine. But here was another problem. I don't love alcohol. So you mentioned this early on. The um, It surprises a lot of people to hear from the wine guy who they think is selling wine, although I'm not selling wine. I'm really educating people how to think about drinking and how to think about wine if you choose to drink. Drinking's not for everyone. Mm-hmm. But what surprises people here, and no doubt you've heard this on a previous podcast, alcohol is a very dangerous neurotoxin. It ruins millions of lives a year. And so I choose to drink alcohol because I love wine, but I don't love alcohol. Therefore, we only sell and drink lower alcohol wines. And alcohol in very moderate 
doses has been shown to be beneficial to a number of um, biological and neurological functions. But alcohol, again, is not right for everyone, right? And so you have to be careful with it. For me, I just happen to really, really love wine. I just don't really, really like alcohol. And at points in my adult life, I've had what I would call a tenuous relationship with it when I used to drink spirits and party like a rock star and, you know, 30 years ago. And, but today, you know, I, I, this was, so when I started this experimentation with the ketogenic diet, I found I couldn't drink wines anymore. They were making me sick. I was going to hang over, flush, just didn't feel bad. And so um, I started investigating I really thought it was just the alcohol because alcohol has been steadily rising in wines for the last 40 years because the alcohol, the wine industry loves alcohol for a bunch of reasons, for reasons I've already told you that it's a bad drug, but here's some more problems with it. Why the, why the alcohol industry likes it and why the wine industry likes it. Alcohol is addictive. It's also what I call a domino drug, meaning the more you drink, the more likely you are to drink more. So consequently, the more alcohol you consume, the more likely you are to consume more. Everybody knows this who's ever drank, right? And so, and so it, it's, you know, but for me, I don't want to drink more. I want to drink less, but have the same level of enjoyment. And so that's, that's, that's sort of how I think about it. But when I, I, initially when I started investigating wines, I didn't know about all the dark secrets I'm going to tell you about in a moment. I didn't know about those. I just thought that it was high alcohol. So I just thought if I drink lower alcohol, then, um, then I'll feel better. And of course you do. And so um, I was talking with a, a friend of mine who's the smartest person I know in the wine business. And I said, we were in Mexico on a vacation. And I said, listen, I'm going to make a, I want to make a low alcohol wine. Now, at that time, what I meant by that was that you, there's two technical processes that you can remove alcohol from wine, right? And so the, the most common is a reverse osmosis where you separate the alcohol from the water. Water and alcohol are the two primary things in wine. And so I thought I would make a low alcohol wine through this technical process. And he said, have you tasted any of the low alcohol wines made in Europe? I was like, no, I have no idea. Neither does anybody else, right? Because all the wines that they see are 14 or 15, 15 and a half percent alcohol. He said, yeah, there's some low alcohol wines being made old style in Europe. So it's like, so I started investigating that. And that's when I stumbled upon the natural wine revolution. And so the term natural wine, which is an internationally recognized category of wine, is confusing to consumers who don't know about it. Because I say, yeah, we drink natural wines. And they're like, well, aren't all wines natural? Or organic. And they're not, kind of differentiate well, that too. Well, organic and natural are not the same thing. So let me differentiate that quickly before I Please, yeah. talk about what, 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 what is natural and is not natural. This is further confusing to consumers. So all natural wines are farmed organically. But not all organic wines are natural. Okay, you can't make natural wine in very large quantities. So when you go into Whole Foods and you see an organic wine, it's almost certainly not going to be natural, right? Because you can't make volumes of wine to supply somebody like Whole Foods. And but what organic means is that it was farmed organically. That doesn't speak to the cellar practices, okay. which is what we're going to talk about now. So the biggest dirty dark secret of the wine business is that there are. 76 additives approved by the FDA for the use in winemaking. Now, why don't you know about those 76 additives? Well, it's very simple. It's because the wine industry has spent millions of dollars in lobby money in Washington, D.C. to successfully and fight successfully to keep contents labeling off of wine bottles. Wine is the only major food product without a contents label. N nor does it have nutritional information on it either, so you don't know how much sugar is in it. Sure. Right? And so these 76 additives, many of them are natural, but many of them are not, and several of them are highly toxic. And so this, you know, if you choose to drink these toxins in your wine, I, I applaud you. The problem is you don't know that you're drinking them. And so what I think we should have is transparency and labeling. So you know if there's dimethyl dicarbonate in your wine or not. 
you know if there's glyphosate in your wine. You know if there's ammonia phosphate or copper sulfate. These are all approved chemicals for the use in winemaking, and then they are used widely in commercial wines. So here's how this all began, right? So 100 years ago, all wines were made naturally, right? And then the thing that happened to the wine business was called money and greed, right? And so it began in the late 1920s up and started in various places between the 1920s and the early 1940s where we adapted, you know, this uh, mono agricultural farming practices, which was the use of chemicals in farming, right? Instead of a poly agricultural practice, which is the recognition of the whole biodiverse sphere of natural farming. But so really, you know, it, it started with chemicals in farming. That's where it began. And then move forward a few, a few decades, and what's happened to the wine industry today is the same thing that's happened in our food supply. So in our food supply, about 10 companies make or touch almost everything that goes into a package, right? Either from farming to processing to brand ownership and so on and so forth. Now, they're not the same, they're not the same companies that we eat from because I'm eating whole and raw and real food. I don't eat processed food. But even in farming, when you go into Whole Foods and you're buying organic vegetables, those are all coming from a handful of companies, very large companies, very large farming companies, even though they're organic. And I like to talk about, when I compare, while we're talking about organic farming and vegetables, I like to compare natural wine when you think about organic wine versus a natural wine, or wine grown on a small family farm versus a large organic farmer. It's the same thing as when you go into Whole Foods and you see the organic vegetables there. They look very different than the vegetables you see at your farmer's market, right? The ones at the farmer's market are vibrant and lush and just like you just want to take a photograph of them, right? Because they're so beautiful and they're so poignant. But you don't see the cabbage in Whole Foods doesn't look that way, even though it's organic, right? So it's just that small, loving, tender, the care that a small family farm really dedicates to living soil because what what is really bringing that vibrancy the health and flavor and the extraordinary appearance is really about living soil it's about, about soil management right you can be organically farmed but not have living soil not in the same way not in this loving way you know what i'm talking about from farmers market right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh yeah yeah so so anyway so w with this in our food industry, we have massive corporate consolidation, right? These big companies buying up, using leverage debt, buying up all the, all the smaller companies or medium-sized companies. Same thing happened in the wine business. So here's the deal. In the wine business, the top three wine companies in the United States make over 52% of all wines. And the top 30 companies make over 70% of U.S. wines. So when you go into the grocery store or into a wine shop and you see these rows and rows of bottles, right, perhaps hundreds or thousands of brands and thousands of bottles. Most of that wine is made by just a handful of companies. Now, you don't know that. Another dark secret, see, they don't want you to know that. What they want you to believe is that you're drinking from a farmhouse or a chateau because how you sell wine is through story. I sell wine through science and delicious tastes, but you sell wine in the conventional way through telling a story about it right and romanticizing it same way you sell liquor and so because it's a drug you want to make it romantic right so so they sell these stories to have you believe that you're drinking from a farmhouse or a chateau but in fact you're drinking very often most often more than 50 percent of the time from massive wine factories located in central california and these things are like multiple football fields large they're huge right? Huge tank farm, what are called tank farms. Mm -hmm. And so that's where most of the wine in the United States is manufactured. And it's manufactured, it's not romantically made. It's industrially farmed with chemicals. And then it is made and fermented with chemicals in a, in a way that, that you can't make wine in very large quantities without the use of these additives and chemicals. That's just a fact. So let's talk about natural wine for a second, because again, it's a confusing term, but Internationally, it's a recognized category, although there's no official certification for it yet. 
Now, Dry Farm Wines, we have a certification, which is over and above, over and above just natural. And we talk about that in a moment. But France just announced about a month ago that they were going to be the first country to certify natural wines. And so if you don't know what a natural wine is, here's what a natural wine means. It means that it is either organically or biodynamically farmed. And biodynamic farming is a prescriptive advanced form of organic farming. Number two, it is fermented. This is an important distinction. It is fermented with wild indigenous native yeast to the vineyard. And what's that mean? On the skin of every grape berry in the world at the time of harvest has a waxy kind of whitish translucent film on the outside of it. That's yeast. And that yeast was collected wild and natively through the vineyard in the air. It's a natural yeast. Commercial wines, like all those, all the wines you see in the grocery store, right? Those are fermented with genetically modified lab-grown yeast. Now, the reason they do that is because they can modify these yeasts to be very sturdy and easy to work with. Native yeast, the wild yeast, are temperamental, and you can't make wine in very large volumes. They're just too difficult to work with. They have to be coddled. Right? They also will, will not withstand a very high alcohol environment. And so these, these commercial yeast, the ones that are genetically modified to, they're very strong, they're very sturdy, and they'll withstand a very high alcohol environment without being killed. So the third, the third um, characteristic to natural wine versus uh, commercial wine is that there are no additives in it. So no additions, no corrections. Commercial wines are filled with chemicals and additives and corrections and enhancements from everything from color agents to body enhancers to uh, chemicals used to, to kill um, uh, bacterial faults. The most common bacterial fault in wine is known as Brettanomyces. And if you don't have a super clean cellar and a super clean practice, then it's very easy to get Brettanomyces in your wine, and then they have a very toxic chemical to cure that with, right? And so in these large winemaking environments, you just have to use these chemicals and additives in order to control the environment, right? Because wine has living bacteria in it. And the other thing that happens to the positive living bacteria in a commercial wine is that it gets killed with sulfur dioxide. So it gets sterilized and preserved at bottling. Natural wines are not sterilized. And so the living, gut-friendly bacteria that is alive in natural wines, and Dr. David Perlmutter, who's the New York Times best-selling author of um, The Brain, brain. Of, yeah, of, um, yeah, so he's published several times on our wines, and the specific living bacteria that exists in a natural wine that is beneficial to the gut microbiome. And so commercial wines have sterilized and killed that. In addition to you're getting a heavy dose of sulfur dioxide. So that's the difference between what a commercial wine is and what a natural wine is and why natural wines are just generally healthier. In our particular case, we have a few additional qualifications, strict criteria for purity and health that we require that not all natural wines meet. Right, so uh, to give you an example, dry farming or irrigation-free farming. Dry farming means to farm without irrigation. And that, that's the name of your company, Dry Farm Wine. So that's where that comes from, is not right. using irrigation. It, it means irrigation-free farming. Okay. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why that's, why that's dynamically important. One, you know, it's, one, it saves a lot of water. Number two, the vine is actually healthier and, and the fruit contains more polyphenols and flavonoids and antiflavonoids. Those are the, the health compounds in wine, primarily found in red wine. We can talk about that in a moment, but they're higher, polyphenols are higher in dry farm wine. They're also higher in organic wine. And so, and uh, number three, it produces a higher quality fruit. So, when the vine struggles, just like everything in nature, struggle creates power and strength, right? And so when the vine struggles to find water and nutrient, it produces a higher quality fruit. So 
when an irrigated grapevine has a root ball that's about three feet wide and about three feet deep, that's the pretty much the entire root, root structure because it gets all of its nutrient in the way of liquid nitrogen and its water source from a little tube that's hanging just above the trunk. An unirrigated grapevine can have a root structure that can span 40 feet deep as it searches and struggles to find microscopic particles of moisture and nutrient. This struggle and its relationship with the minerals deeper in the earth create a higher quality fruit, which is why it's illegal in most of all Europe to irrigate a grapevine. Wow. However, in the United States, more than 99% of grapevines are irrigated. So you might ask, well, why would you irrigate? Well, it comes back to money and greed. So irrigation simply makes farming easier, mm -hmm. less expensive, and more profitable. See, so commercial winemakers are not trying to make wine healthier or better. They're trying to make it faster and cheaper, right? Because it's all about profit. And so that that's so the irrigation is 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 a, is a fundamental issue for us. But it also go ahead. I was going to say thank you for explaining that. So I live in Iowa, and so I we see irrigation rigs everywhere, right? Iowa, Nebraska, we have decent soil here in Iowa, but we, we still, farmers at least tend to think they need that water. And so that's backwards to my thinking. I just, I'm not a farmer, but I come from farming families and I just assume, oh, we need the irrigation, but explaining that the plant needs to struggle um, and that will create strength for the plant and its health benefits makes a lot of sense. So thank you. Yeah, for it depends on what you're growing. Not everything can grow ir irrigation free. Sure. You know, okay. lettuce will not grow irrigation free. So it depends on what you're growing. Tomatoes will, you know, tomatoes are dry farmed and, and, yeah. and quite cherished. I mean, if you can find dry farm tomatoes, they're way more difficult to farm. Sure. They take longer and they're slower and more difficult, but but not everything can be farmed and certainly not at scale, but grapes can be farmed at any scale irrigation free. And they're grown all over the planet in some of the harshest conditions and grapevines have been living around the world for more than 10,000 years. Irrigation didn't even come to California for grape farming until the early 1970s. Prior to that, everything in California was also dry farmed. It's just that, again, it produces a higher yield. Mm -hmm. Irrigation produces a bigger cluster, and the berries, it might not surprise you, when they're filled with water, they weigh more, and fruit is sold by the ton. More it weighs, more it's worth. Sure, more water sense. it has in it, more it's going to weigh. That's, sure. that's not rocket science, right? And so that's, so back to the dry farm certification. So it's dry farmed. Mm -hmm. uh, it is organic or biodynamic. It is fermented with wild native yeast. We are sugar-free, and the only way to know if a wine is sugar-free is a lab test it. And we uh, do not allow any sugar in our wine. Uh, it's additive-free. It's a additive-free and lower alcohol. So we don't drink or sell anything over 12.5%. The average wine today in America is almost 15%. That doesn't sound like a big difference, but trust me, it is. And most of the wines I drink are between 9 and 11%. And our lowest wine is at 7%. And people love low alcohol. We just introduced um, a low al our lowest alcohol wine, which was at 7% about three weeks ago, and it sold out in the same day, right? And so uh, people are conscious about alcohol. Mm -hmm. Millennials, and particularly as your age, as you get older, you just don't process it as well, sure. right? And so it's really important in my view. And I, look, most of my friends and most everybody I know doesn't have a glass of wine. They have several, right? And so if you want to lower, lower your alcohol intake, then you're going to, um, you're, you're going to start with a, a lower alcohol underlying product, right? Unless you're just going to have the one glass. But I don't normally see that. I don't <laughs> normally see people open a bottle and have a glass. They have several. You know, and they're sharing and love generates, I mean, wine generates love, right? So, I mean, wine just is kind of like a, it's just a lover's drink, right? So when you're drinking with, you know, with a date or your partner or, you know, it just generates love and you tend to drink a little bit more, right? Because it's fun. <laughs> 
I want to go back to some of the points you mentioned. I have, I may not say this correctly, but I, I've heard you speak in other podcasts about one of the chemicals that you may actually have already mentioned being so toxic that when the winery is cleaned, whatnot, or, or when it's used, no one can even be present. Do you know what I'm It's called about? dimethyl dicarbonate. But you did mention it. Okay. And so, well, I didn't mention that part about it. Okay. So it's so toxic that when it's applied to the wine, it has to be applied by a specially licensed contractor who comes in, the winery has to be empty, and they come in in hazmat suits, and they apply this toxic chemical. If you were to breathe it in its raw form, it would burn your lungs. If you got it on your skin, it would burn you. It's highly toxic. When it's applied to the wine, if you drain the wine within the first 24 hours, you would likely die, right? That's and nuts. That's nuts to me. That. Well, it is, but it's used to treat Bretomyces, the, the, the most common bacterial fault I mentioned earlier. This okay. chemical is used to treat that, that bacterial fault. Sure. And tens of millions of gallons of California wine are treated every year, right? And so the problem is you just don't know if the wine you're drinking has been treated or not. Right. And so I'm all for it. If you want to drink dimethyl dicarbonate, knock yourself out. I just think you should know. I think you should have a choice to know what you're drinking. Right. And, uh, and so the now, in fairness to the company that makes it, which is located here in Northern California, about 45 minutes from where I live, you know, in fairness, they claim that this toxin, if you look up dimethyl dicarbonate in Wikipedia, it will say hazard colon toxic. Right? They claim that this toxin hydrolyzes into methanol and, and carbon dioxide. So even even if that's true, I have a problem with that too because methanol is far more toxic than than ethanol, which is the alcohol in wine, right? So I don't want to be drinking methanol either. Sure. What about coloration? So again, correct me if I'm wrong, but all grape juice is clear for right. the most part, right? So where do wines get the color, and are many companies then using additives to darken the wine? They are. So it's a great question because one of the biggest myths about red wine, particularly in the United States, is that people believe that the darker a red wine is, the higher quality it is. Well, there's no truth to that statement at all. In fact, I would propose that just the opposite may be true. But you see, so, so here's how red wine gets its color and also its increase in polyphenols. So let's talk about the winemaking process for a moment because this is important in both color and also the health properties of wine. So polyphenols, flavonoids, antiflavonoids, and other compounds that are thought to be the health properties of wine are found in both white wines and red wines. There are about 200 polyphenols in white wines, but there are over 800 found in red wines, which is red, why red wines are thought to be a healthier choice of, of drink. So how it, how they get those extra polyphenols in red wine is the same way that it gets its color. So when you press the juice from a white wine grape and you press the juice from red wine grape, they're both clear or basically clear. Then when you make white wine, you press the, the juice off of the berries in a bladder press. And then that press just flows over that, that juice, that free run juice goes into a tank where it's fermented. When you make red wine, you press the juice off from the berry into a tank. But then after you've pressed the juice off the skins, you add the skins, the seeds, and, and some... St that was a different notification <laughs> uh, from my calendar. So anyway, when, you, when, you, when the, you press the juice off into a tank, you then take the skins, the seeds, and some remaining stems, and you add those into the tank with the red wine juice, with the red grape juice. It's the contact with the skins and the seeds that give red wine its color, and it's also what gives it its tannin structure, and it's also what creates the increase in polyphenols, is the skin contact. Now, here's what's happening with commercial wines. Two things to get them darker. One, the maceration period, and that's what maceration is, is the time that the, the skins stay in the juice. The time that they, the longer they stay in, the darker the wine will get. 
The problem with that is that the longer they stay in, you also get elevated biogenetic amines, primarily tyramine and histamine. Mm. So, so this is the reason that women, particularly in their middle age and up, women have a very difficult time drinking red wine. They can drink white wine fine, but they can't drink red wine because it makes them splotchy, it makes them sniffy, it makes it gives them tension in their frontal frontal cortex. It it uh, it can make them feel blotchy or hot. This is, this is by, these are amines, primarily tyramine and histamine. And so that's, so to get further color, if that isn't enough, then, then they add a color agent to make the wine darker. And this very commonly results in what we know as purple teeth. Right, so if you've ever seen people <laughs> drinking wine and getting purple lip or purple teeth, that almost always comes from a color additive, because when you drink natural wine, you drink real wine, you won't get your teeth will not become discolored, you know, and um, and your lips won't become discolored. So, and of course, the more porous your teeth are, the more discolored they become. But most of these, most of this discoloration from drinking red wines is coming from color agents. Now, the color agents in my opinion, are not unsafe. Uh, so, so they're a naturally made product. I don't, I don't think that they're necessarily unsafe. We don't know that, but I just rather drink kind of like real, honest, additive-free wine, right? Look, there's no studies done because nobody's financed them. There's no studies that have been done to know whether these additives are harmful or not. Here's what I do know, anecdotal, anecdotally is when I drink natural wine, I just feel better, right? Everyone does. That's the reason that we have hundreds of thousands of customers and we're the largest natural wine buyer in the world because you just feel better. And people who are interested in their health and who want to feel better and who are sensitive, look, most of the people walking around out there don't know how they feel because they feel so bad, Mm -hmm. right? But for people who eat, a natural clean diet and who exercise and who care about what they put in their body, they know what they feel like mm-hmm. and they know to feel is to understand they're in touch with their body and they know if they drink or eat something that doesn't make them feel bad, they don't want to drink or eat that again. Right. And then when they drink or eat something that does make them feel good or better, you know, they're like, Oh, I didn't know I was really feeling bad before, <laughs> you know? And so a lot of people who are drinking wine who are even interested in their health don't know that they feel bad. They think this is just what drinking wine feels like. Right, right. Well, congratulations on your incredible growth. I know your company is one of the fastest growing private companies without any debtor investors. So that's, that's amazing. Congratulations on that. You also cater to actually where I recently saw you, kind of recently, last fall at Mindshare, the Mindshare conference. You're one of the exclusive, I don't know how to say that, I guess, wine. Well, we're the, we're, we're the official wine for, for okay. JJ and Mindshare. Yep, yep. There are no other wines there. It's just <laughs> us. So when I saw you last fall, I was still breastfeeding at that time, but I, I thought, you know, I need to go ask them about their uh, sugar content because I had heard you were sugar-free and I wasn't quite sure if that meant fructose-free. Also, I've had a fructose intolerance. Yes. And so I asked one of the staff members there, I said, so technically are these wines fructose-free? Like, can I, can I consume this? Because uh, many juices, right? Like I could never have yeah. apple juice per se, like that, that causes. Well, who would drink fruit juice in the first place is terrible <laughs> for you. Whether <laughs> right. you're intolerant to it or not. I mean, fructose right. is extremely, extremely unhealthy. Right. And the, the fruit has gotten somehow this, you know, this health food reputation, but let's be clear, most fruit, look, ancestry, we have to look back to our ancestral roots, right? So in most of the world, including the places where you were genetically created, you know, it, it, there, there, fruit was available only, only rarely, A, means seasonally, and if you could find it. So your ancestors who were just starting to walk around, right, and, and, and evolving, Fruit was very, very rare, and further, it was seasonal, and further, it didn't taste anything like the genetically modified fruit that you find in the grocery store today. A wild orange, if you could find one, is quite bitter, actually, right? And so, so ancestrally, we just, our bodies, you know, were not equipped to process fructose in, in, on a regular basis. Occasionally, seasonally, 
at a much lower level than what you see in fruits today. So fruit juice, orange juice, is one of the most toxic things we can put in our body that's made from nature, right? We've removed the fiber, right? We've concentrated the sugar. And now, you know, and now, and then no, most people are drinking in the morning in a fasted state, you know, for just a massive glucose spike. Mm -hmm. And so I happen to believe, and most of the people that I follow and the people that follow us believe that that hyper production of insulin is the cause of most chronic disease, right? I mean, the, 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 the hormone, which is why mm -hmm. I fast, we talk about that in a moment, but the, the, the hormone that was originally evolved to keep us alive during famine, right, which is insulin, is now killing us because from its overstimulation. Because ancestrally, when, as we evolved, we weren't eating three meals a day, right? We may eat once a day, or there would be days where we didn't have access to food source at all, right? And so, and so we needed insulin to store reserves, fat reserves, right, for, for energy during famine. And, uh, and now, you know, we, most people, you know, eat five, six, seven, eight times a day of some form, right? And, and, and pancreas never gets a rest, right? I mean, it's just like it's producing insulin all the time mm -hmm. and making us insulin resistant over time and then type 2 diabetic. Sure. And so, but I believe and everybody I follow and, you know, and follow us also believe that it creates, you know, other chronic illnesses. Sure. So I really needed to be educated though, since I, I wasn't quite clear on how wine was made, like how your wine could be sugar-free, right? Because I'm well, thinking, I can, do I, I drink this, do I too. not? Sure. So did your wine have fructose? Did it have sugar? Like what, how is it sugar-free? Well, we, te so we test for that. both glucose and fructose. And our restriction on both is less than one gram per liter. Now, a wine bottle, which st statistically at the serving level, that's sugar-free. A wine bottle is 750 milliliters. A liter is 1,000 milliliters. So a wine bottle in of itself is not even a liter. And we require that it be less than one gram per liter, which is statistically sugar-free. Which is amazing now, give, as compared I'm, to, yeah. yeah. I'm going to give you the comparison. <laughs> so we just about six months ago, we tested the top 20 selling wines in the United States. That's easy to find out on the Internet. Right, as are all of the wine additives, the industry figures I told you, everything I've told you is easily, it's not my opinion, it's easily verifiable in, just in a Google search. But the, we did lab testing on the top 20 selling wines in the United States. Of the top 20, only two met our requirement for sugar. The rest were higher. And so, you know, I'm just, I'm just anti-sugar. And so I just think sugar is, I think sugar is the most widely abused and addictive drug on the planet, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's no doubt sugar is addictive. There's how, plenty of studies to show that. How many grams is in a Coca-Cola? or a 32 grams. Okay. Yikes. So, so yeah, your wine so is sugar-free. <laughs> yeah. And then if you, but if you look at, if you look at any kind of drinks, juices, I mean, you're going to see nine to 30 grams, nine to 25 grams, you know, in all drinks. I mean, they're just like, they're filled with sugar, everything, right. salad dressings, ketchup, condiments. I mean, almost everything has sugar in it. And I mean, you have to go to a lot of effort to, um, to avoid sugar, a lot of effort. I mean, forget about candy or, you know, caramel popcorn, or forget about the, the, or food, forget about the obvious things. You know, if you want to live a sugar-free lifestyle or a very sugar, low sugar lifestyle, you have to put a lot of focus and effort into that. So I talked about how low sugar your wines are. What about sulfites? I know that will be a question. Uh, how low sulfite are your products? Sulfur has been used to preserve wine since the Romans. And so the question that sulfur brings in is how much is in it. Now, so there are two things. Sulfites are naturally occurring in any kind of fermented product as well as hundreds of other food types. So sulfites are naturally occurring. Now, they can be naturally occurring. They're measured in parts per million. 
So sulfites can be naturally occurring up to 75 parts per million, which is our limitation on sulfites. Okay. However, our average sulfite is 39. Now, the U.S. limit, legal limit by, by, by the FDA, is 350 parts per million. So on average, our wines are nearly 10 times lower. Uh, that being said, uh, you don't normally see wines at 350 parts per million when we've done lab testing on commercial wines. Normally, they range between 150 and 200 parts per million. And look, we don't really know what that means. We don't really know what that means from a health point of view. Again, there's no science around it. And sulfur has been used for a long time. But in my particular case, I'd just rather drink fewer additives. Sure. So, you know, I, I would, uh, people, sulfites get a much, there's a lot of myths around sulfites. Sulfites get a much better wrap than, than probably really are. Um, I think the other additives are far more damaging than, than, than sulfur. The main problem I have with sulfur is that it sterilizes the wine to preserve it and it kills the bacteria in the wine and it kills the taste of the wine and it McDonaldizes a wine, right? It makes every single bottle taste the same. It makes, you know, the, the, the wine, the mass wine industry's goal is to have everything taste the same, McDonaldize it, right? And for natural wine, it's not like that. You'll get bottle to bottle variation. This bottle might taste a little bit like this and this bottle, bottle tastes a little bit like that because they've not been sterilized. And so as the bacteria evolves, these are friendly, healthy bacteria as they evolve, you know, we can taste different. You can get bottle to bottle variation. Well, you know, commercial wines don't want that. They want you to taste the same thing, just like when you go to McDonald's, the same thing over and over and over again. Because <clears throat> that's the way most people consume flavors. And do you so think that people, adds the addictive benefit to that also? I mean, I don't know, but, like, but here's what we do. We, yeah, we, nature. <laughs> yeah, we, we see most of us think that we're a lot more ambitious eaters than we are. Like we'll try new things. The fact of the matter is most of us eat the same thing, the same taste profile over and over and over again. We go to the same restaurant on a regular basis. We usually get the same dishes over and over and over again. Right. And so this consistency and taste and you're opening something and you taste it that's habitually friendly to you, that you know what it is, that's very comforting to you. And so that sells more wine, right, because you know what it is and it's somehow you've got, you know, you have an affinity for it. Then you also get palate fatigue from our point of view. You know, it's like tastes the same all the time. It's like this is kind of boring. So anyway, that's. So with your wine club, you're intentionally rotating. <laughs> we do. So, I mean, your... every single box is, in, unless you want us to do something custom for you or you want a special order of a certain wine of which we do all of the above. But just in our regular delivery boxes, every single box is different and every single wine is different, right? And then if you see a wine, if you taste a wine, you're like, oh, wow, I'm really in love with that. Then, you know, we have a special service to get you more of it if you want it. But this sure. concept of being able to taste these different wines are you're tasting wines you had no idea, grapes that you had no idea. And Americans know the top eight grapes, Cabernet, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Merlot. Um, th th so these are, these are what are familiar to, to American wine drinkers. But then there's Pinot Denis, there's Schiava, there's Trousseau, there's Nero Davlo. There's all these grapes from around the world that you have no idea what they are and you would never buy them because you don't know what they are. People buy what's familiar to them. But then they get introduced to like kind of taking a trip around the ancestral wine world around the world, right? And it's just like, and you taste these things, you're like, oh, wow, that's fantastic. I've never tasted anything like that. No, because you, you don't have any frame of reference. What our customers depend on us to do is taste these wines, make sure that they're delicious and they're outstanding and that they're excellent and then bring them these experiences, right? We, we only buy 30% of the wines that we taste and then consequently lab test. Sure. So we do lab testing on every wine. If you, you know, for sugar, for alcohol, for mold, you asked about yeah. mold earlier, for mycotoxins particularly, we're mm -hmm. looking for ochratoxin A. And so all of our wines are tested for mold. U.S. wines are not tested for mold. It is not a requirement of the law to test for mold. It is in Europe. So no wines here. U.S. wines don't get tested for mold unless they're exported to Europe. 
If they're exported mm. to Europe, they have to go mm. along with a lab report, including a, a mold analysis. Very interesting. It sounds too good to be true. <laughs> low sugar, low alcohol, no mold, <laughs> paleo, keto friendly. I mean, low histamine, no, no histamine lower sulfite. Uh, and you just feel better if you drink them. And, yeah, and yeah. You, I assume you've drank them by I now. I have, I have, I have. Yeah. They are delicious. Yes. Yeah, they're not only delicious, but you just feel better. You know, agreed, just, agreed. You, you just I, feel better. You feel better while drinking. You feel better the next day. You just feel better. I, I took a risk. Normally, I would never have a glass of wine before working the next day seeing patients. <laughs> but Monday night, I did. And I felt fine. <laughs> nice. <on> Tuesday. <laughs> nice. Oh. Well, I know we're coming up on the end of your show. So yes. So I did tell, want... I did want to offer your, your listeners a special offer. Go for so it. it's a penny bottle from, from you, a penny bottle, and they get that on their first order. And uh, all they have to do is go to this link, and they'll see the landing page to get this penny. It would be free, but it's because the law for us to give wine away for free. <laughs> so we charge one penny for it. Anyway, it's Dry Farm Wines with an S, dot com forward slash gray. G R A Y. Again, that's dry farm wines.com forward slash gray. Thank you so much. That a wonderful promotion. Very generous. I have to ask you one last question though. So you do live a ketogenic lifestyle, no sugar. What's your top longevity tip? Absolute top longevity tip. Fasting. I think fasting is the single most potent treatment that we have for, I'm not alone, I'm not alone in this. You know, Peter Atia was just doing a, a podcast on fasting with a, with a metabolic expert recently. And he's like, you know, this is the most, we have n little to no research on fasting. He thinks it's the most potent therapeutic uh, treatment or drug that we have. The problem is we don't know how to dose it. Right. So as you know, I'm just finishing or tonight I will finish a, I'll wrap up a four day water fast and I have experimented with all types of fasting regiments. Uh, I only eat once per day anyway. So I'm on a 22 hour intermittent fast and have been for three and a half years. Wow. And then I supplement that with monthly and quarterly, usually three day fast monthly. I do a five day fast quarterly. But the reason I do three and four days now is because I feel for me that most of the benefit comes in day one and two. Um, day two is the most uncomfortable for me. And by day three, I could just go on for days without eating, right? And so for me, it feels like that, that, the, that the stress, that the, that the struggle really happens mid day two. Uh, to early day three. And so I, I, I can fast longer, but, but I'm not trying to lose weight. And so I could fast longer. It's just I don't, and I have this love affair with food and wine because I don't drink wine when I'm fasting. So um, I just, I don't, feel, I don't feel that I'm getting that much more additional benefit beyond day three or four. Sure. And so, and I think that's pretty common. Uh, it also interrupts my sleep. You know, I, I sleep much lighter and much shorter for you know, reasons that we talked about earlier before the podcast, for ancestral reasons. I think that people just sleep less when they're fasting. If we were without food, you know, um, 10,000 years ago or 15,000, 20,000 or 50,000 years ago without food, you know, we would need to, because we didn't have food source, we would need to get up earlier, be very acute very energetic and go find some food and you know that so that fits into the ancestral logic if we if in fact not eating we know that we know our ancestors did not eat on a regular basis if not eating in fact made us lethargic and tired and sleepy as many people think it does because they're addicted to sugar and glucose but when you're ketogenic that's not true and when you go into a longer term fast you become ketogenic just by default from not eating, from starvation. So, you know, if in fact we became lethargic and tired and sleepy from not eating, we wouldn't have survived as a species, right? In fact, just the opposite happens. Sure. And so we're energetic, we sleep less, we get up earlier. Um, and it's one of the things I don't really enjoy about, um, about extended fasting is I just don't sleep as well. Um, 
I just have energy and I just, just, just simply don't sleep as well. But, um, but yeah, so I think, it's, I think longevity for me, I think fasting, uh, but I would say in the order of priority, meditation is number one. And fasting is number two, because until we can dial down the cortisol, until we can dial down the monkey mind and the stress and the anxiety that day-to-day -day living creates, which anxiety help with um, meditation cures that and helps with that. And the longer your practice, the more silent your mind becomes. You know, most of most people are walking around with, you know, with extreme trauma of thinking. Right, so trauma is injury, injury to the injury to the mind from thinking, and what they're thinking about are either regrets of the past, or more frequently, anxieties of the future. Right, so, and for all the suffering we have faced for evils that never found us, right? So, if we can slow that down. And no matter how good you become at silencing the mind and controlling your breath and controlling your your response to stresses, none of us are enlightened, so we're still going to be challenged by it. But a practice of meditation will allow us to at least help with that trauma and that injury to the mind, which then, in fact, runs throughout the body. You know, so I think meditation is the single most important practice a human, a, an adult can have. And then fasting, uh, just following that. But both require practice. Both are somewhat, or at least perceived to be difficult. Um, and so, you know, with meditation, the primary complaint is I don't have time to meditate. And what I say to that is the people who don't have time to meditate need meditation the most. <laughs> yep. Right. And then for fasting, people just like, I don't know how you do it. You know, I don't know. You know, fasting is mental. There's nothing too challenging about it. It's just, it's emotional because we, we love to eat and we love to eat our feelings. You know, and we lo we're hedonist. You know, we like the pleasure of food. So anyway, thanks for having me on today. You're very inspiring for topping off your fast with a podcast with me. So thank you for coming on the show and offering our audience that amazing promotion. And congrats again on the success of your company and spreading the truth about the dirty, dark secrets of the wine industry. And just thank you for creating a product that's not going to damage our health, but improve our health. So there's really no reason to not make a safe swap. I think when you make the swap, the safe swap, you'll never go back to the, the toxic stuff. So I hope this evening you get a great night's rest, Todd. <laughs> I will. You. I'm going to have some wine too. <laughs> thank you for coming on the show. All right. Thanks for having me.